evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll call the meeting to order. And welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people here. We've had two meetings in a row where we've had a room full of people. It's great. So I think we figured out if we just front load the meetings with a bunch of proclamations, we get a lot of people here. So anyway, it's good to see everybody um, here tonight. So first, I'd like to welcome, um, did the imam show up, Kamal? Yes. I'd like to welcome Imam Najam Zaman to the podium to bless us with the invocation. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Nice to see you again. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So we'll start with the opening invocation. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, and the generous, all praises and thanks belong to God, Lord of the worlds, the owner and the master of the day of reckoning. You alone do we worship, and you alone do we seek assistance. O Lord, guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path, guide us to the straight path, the path of those who you have bestowed your favors upon, and not the path of those who have gone astray nor earned your wrath. O oh God, you are the forgiving and most generous. You love forgiveness, so forgive us. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. If you would please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, gonna stay here. Stay right there. Sure. So, Brother Gamal Gasser is here also. Brother, would you like to approach the podium? We have a go slightly out of order here, so you guys, because you're already up here. So, we do have a proclamation in recognition of both uh, Ramadan and Muslim Heritage Month. We have a, a number of members of our Muslim community here, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, you're welcome to come up, too, if you'd like. That's fine with us. Well, we'll do that for the picture. How's that? So uh, the proclamation reads as so. It says, whereas freedom of religion holds the distinction as a cherished right and a foundational value upon which the laws and ethics of the United States are based, and whereas, enriched by the unparalleled diversity of its residents, the city of Temple Terrace takes great pride in supporting individuals who express their religious freedom and is strengthened by the many varied cultural traditions of its diverse population, including those of Muslim Americans. Whereas, Islam is the second largest region in the world and there are millions of Muslim Americans, both immigrants and native-born, of diverse backgrounds and beliefs. Whereas it is estimated that 20 to 25 percent of Temple Terrace residents are Muslims. Whereas Muslim Americans have contributed to every part of American society to make advancements in architecture, arts, business, culture, government, law, medicine, military, religion, and sports. Whereas Islamic traditions and values bring balance and peace to many of life's problems and often serve as a source of inspiration and reflections for billions of individuals. Whereas for the followers of the Islamic faith, Ramadan is the holiest month of the Islamic calendar and is, regard and is regarded as a time for spiritual reflection, solidarity with the less fortunate and the bridging of differences between people over a shared commitment to faith. Now, therefore, I, Andrew Ross, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Temple Terrace, Florida, encourage the community to reflect on the history and contributions of Muslims in Temple Terrace, the state, and the nation through the celebration of Ramadan and Muslim Heritage Month this year in the city of Temple Terrace, Florida. Thank you. Gentlemen, would you like to say a few words? Yes, uh, sir. Uh, Imam Najm here is going to be delivering a short speech regarding Ramadan and Muslims in the area. Uh, please uh, ask him to uh, go ahead. Very good. Thank you so much. Although uh, your speech uh, might have sufficed for what I was going to say, thank you very much. You hit many points on the head. Good evening, esteemed guests, councilmen and women, mayor in the city of Temple Terrace. Thank you for this opportunity to speak and for the opportunity to recognize this significant month for Muslims. The prayer that I read is actually the first chapter in the Quran, which translates as the opening, which seemed fit to use as the opening of this event. 
the Holy Quran is a direct speech of God given to the best of angels, Gabriel, then revealed to the last prophet and messenger, Muhammad. May the peace and blessings be upon him. It is in fact that this Quran was revealed in the holy month of Ramadan in the last ten nights, which signifies the veneration and honor of the holy month. The great action of fasting is observed for a fixed number of days during this month. While many may think that fasting is a new phenomenon or just cruelty to the body, it is quite the opposite. First of all, many previous prophets fasted, such as Moses, David, Abraham, and others, which their stories are referenced and preserved in the Holy Quran, and we are ever connected to them. The obligation of fasting came from above the heavens, a direct commandment from God, similar to the commandments of the prayers, giving charity, wearing the head scarf, being good to one's parents, being upright and just, being good to one's neighbors, spending on our families and treating them kindly, standing up for the oppressed, feeding the poor and needy, taking care of the or orphans and widowers, staying away from harm and things that harm the body or things that harm others, just to name a few. Islam is a very comprehensive way of life that ensures religious, spiritual, physical, mental, and financial well-being are being met, something that most people in life are striving for. After many years of being a social worker and a counselor, I can tell you that most people who are in a state of depression and anxiety are the ones with little or no faith. While there are many studies and research that shows the medical benefits of fasting, such as prevention of Alzheimer's, creation of new neurons, and proteins in the brain that fight against medical ailments, the main objectives are quite clear in the Quran about fasting and that is to develop piety and closeness to the Creator and develop gratitude and thanks to the Creator. While fasting, Muslims practice something called imsak, which is known as refraining, or in layman terms, self-control and self-discipline. Refraining from things that God made lawful to us all the time, food, drink, and intercourse, helps put things into perspective. And it is during Ramadan that one's purpose in life becomes clearer. While the focus on the self and the soul is primarily done in this month, other good deeds are also enacted and done, such as feeding the poor, giving charitable donations, refraining from ba bad speech and bad habits, being kind and doing merciful acts to others. While I can go on and on about the many virtues of this month, I will simply close by saying Ramadan has already been established for us and no one could ever take that away. But we deeply recognize the abundant efforts of the council, Mayor Andy Ross, Council Member Meredith Abel, Vice Mayor James Chambers, Council Member Allison Fernandez, and Council Member Gil Schisler, City Manager Carlos Baia, I hope I said that right, and others. These actions of yours demonstrates your tolerance, compassion, and understanding towards minorities, the underserved, and towards the Muslim population here in Temple Terrace. These are qualities of great leaders, and we implore you to continue on this route and welcome you to share in future opportunities with Muslims. For that, we are grateful and thankful, and we humbly accept the decoration of Ramadan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I know. Thank you. Come on up. We're going to crowd in, though, because we don't want to be There you go. Right up front. Uh, we're going to have to squish in here a little bit. All right. First, we're going to look at our photographer and then we'll look at everybody else one at a time. Now we'll look at the next one. Give me a minute. She wants to get in the picture. Hold on. Okay. Oh we missed one. Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> We missed one. Oh, well, give your phone to, we can use your phone again. All right, here we go. We're going to look at our photographer again. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
All right. We, get, we want to get one with the other half of the audience? <laughs> oh, okay. It's not. It's not. Oh, back, back, back. Come on, look. Somebody take it so you can get it. Oh, I got it. That's okay. I got it. So everybody's here. All right. MashaAllah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank Good problem. So it is. So next we have, um, for those of you who don't come to our meetings frequently, which I don't blame you, um, we have started a fairly new tradition here uh, at the suggestion of Council Member Fernandez. It's kind of a fun thing to do. And so at the beginning of each meeting, we start with a fun fact about uh, Temple Terrace. And sometimes it's a historical fact or something that not everybody knows, but just some we call it a fun fact. Some months, sometimes it's funner than others. But uh, so tonight we have Vice Mayor Chambers is here to present the fun fact. Okay, the fact, maybe not so much fun, but it's about uh, the Temple Terrace Library. Uh, the library was started in 1960 by the Temple Terrace Women's Club. Uh, they got together and decided they wanted to have a library. Uh, they staffed it by volunteers. And it was in the former Caddy House, which was uh, right near the uh, uh, 18th Green on the corner of Inverness and Glen Arvin. Members of the Women's Club raised funds for the project, while local scout groups collected donations for books and other items. Within a little more than a year, April 1961, the library outgrew that building and was moved to, at that time, City Hall, which was the old casino building, uh, on Florida College property, which was demolished a few years ago. With the growing demand, the city leaders appointed a library board, which is still in existence, and took charge of library operations, enabling the library to receive assistance from the Hillsborough County Library System. On April 17, 1966, a new library was dedicated at 202 Bullard Parkway, where it stands today. In April 2nd of 1978, the building was renovated and enlarged. In February 18, 1982, an arsonist broke into the building and set fire to the library. 11,600 books and 1,000 recordings were destroyed in that fire. The library found a temporary home at the Lightfoot Recreation Center, and they stayed there about a year. Gymnastics, which was there, was moved to the family complex during that time. And then the building was uh, rebuilt, and the community once again came to go together to collect funds for more books and other items. And it's kind of that way today. That's the building uh, today. And again, it started with volunteers raising money this year. Uh, the operating budget for the library was $900,000, another $100,000 in capital, so right around a million dollars, and it has 19 employees, so uh, it's come quite a long way in this time. It has. Thank it you, has. Vice Mayor. So was that fun? Thank you. All right, that was a fun fact. Thank you. So is Mr. Carson Workman here? Miss Carson Workman. You're all good. Would you, I'm sorry. No, that's my, my mistake, I'm sorry. So I have a proclamation here for Lung Cancer Action Week uh, that I'd like to share with everybody. And it says, whereas about every two and a quarter minutes, a person in the U.S. is diagnosed with, young, with lung cancer. Whereas lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths. And whereas lung cancer screening saves lives and advocacy and increased awareness will result in more high-risk individuals getting screened. And whereas public support for research funding will result in new treatments and better methods of early detection. And whereas Lung Force is a national initiative led by the American Lung Association to defeat lung cancer. 
Now therefore I, Andrew Ross, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Temple Terrace, Florida, do hereby proclaim May 18 through 14, 2023 as Lung Cancer Action Week. <coughs> and Ms. Workman, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you. So as you stated, the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative unites America to raise critical awareness of lung cancer, the nation's leading cancer killer. We do this during turquoise takeover, which is during Lung Cancer Action Week. While lung cancer survival has increased by nearly 40% over the past decade due to all of our critical work, there is still so much work that needs to be done. It is estimated that in 2023 alone, there'll be over 19,000 people in the state of Florida that will be diagnosed with lung cancer. So each year, we turn the nation turquoise and tell stories of those impacted by lung cancer to change the public's perception about the disease and help save lives. Anyone can get lung cancer, and nobody deserves this. So we greatly appreciate the City of Temple Terrace's support in this important cause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is we have our lead lifeguard, uh, Taylor White, is here. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thanks for being here with us. So this is a proclamation for Water Safety Month. Uh, whereas the City of Temple Terrace is committed to providing water safety education to all residents and visitors, and whereas, according to the Florida Department of Health, Florida is ranked the highest in the U.S. for drowning death, for the drowning death rate among children ages one through four. Annually, deaths in Florida due to drowning among children ages one through four are enough to fill up to four preschool classrooms. That's staggering. Think about that. That's a that's not a statistic to be proud of. There. Whereas, as a community, we understand the essential role that protecting our children from accidental drowning is everyone's responsibility and understand the vital importance of providing access to water safety education and programs to families and individuals of all ages. And whereas, we recognize that it takes a collaborative effort among all groups within the community to be advocates for water safety education. And whereas Water Safety Month is an opportunity to promote water safety and provide education on prevention of recreational water-related injuries, illnesses, and deaths. Now therefore I, Andrew Ross, by virtue of the authority vested in me as Mayor of the City of Temple Terrace, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Water Safety Month. So would you like to say a few words? Just a few. Sure. Um, we strongly recommend anybody to come in and do swim lessons, if it is private or even group, just so that the parents and the children have a better understanding of being safe around the water. So in case the child does fall in, they're able to swim and then float onto their back and then easily swim back to the wall to get out in case their parents or anybody else is not around. Very good. Thank you. And, and this is particularly timely this week when we've had the tragic news of one of our beloved buccaneers two-year-old daughter drowned in the backyard swimming pool and so this is a perfect example you know you can teach small children to swim and so these things don't have to happen so thank you very much Jen Wells, lady who needs no introduction in Temple Terrace, would you please approach? Thanks. 
So, <clears throat> Jen Wells is a beloved citizen of Temple Terrace. For those for those of you who live here, everybody knows Jen. And so, we are very appreciative to Jen for a particular reason tonight, but um, our appreciation goes far beyond this certificate because you've done so much. You and your family have really done so much. So, this is the certificate of recognition presented to Jen Wells for eight years of invaluable service to the city of Temple Terrace for her dedication as a member of the school support committee. After serving as vice chair, Jen served as chair of the school support committee for the past seven years, which is no easy task, I know. Um, during this time, the school support committee was instrumental in assisting with city-supported school boundary updates, granting thousands of dollars to city-supported schools and faculty, and creating a partnership between the city, Hillsborough County School District, school administrators, and faculty. Jen's leadership of the Temple Terrace Reads program and her dedication to her students, fellow educators, and community has not, go on, has not gone unnoticed. And in addition to that, Jen was named a 2023 Top of the Terrace Favorite Teacher this year, too. So I'm sure your accolades are more than that, but that one uh, came in recently. So we They just to surprised me at so. school yesterday. Jen, we can't express all of our appreciation on one certificate, but just know that we really um, appreciate everything that you've done. So please. <laughs> And please, we want a speech. <laughs> I'm, you know, I usually never talk. Um, well, thank you very much for the kind words, Mayor, and of course, all of you for all of your support over the years. It's been amazing, um, everything that we've been able to do with the schools. Um, and as Mayor said, I am, you know, thankfully involved in some other things as well, so I'm not going away. Um, but I definitely appreciate, and I want to say, I know um, Councilman Schischler couldn't be here tonight, but I really appreciate his support as well. He was our liaison for several years, um, and Miss able is now so I know that great things will continue to happen um, with the school support committee you have a great team in place um, one of them is here tonight Mr. Seagrest I'll point him out um, and I, I definitely couldn't have done a lot of it without the city council support I mean the city clerk support as well um, especially Jen Hodges who's now our deputy city clerk um, she's been my right hand person for for several years of me in this position so I know great things will continue to happen with our schools with y'all support um, and I appreciate you recognizing me um, and continue to support Temple Terrace Reads because I am still co-chair of that um, and so like I said you'll still be seeing me around so thank you so much Good. appreciate you guys thank you. I probably should thank my family too they're all here today my mom my dad my brother my nephews and of course my husband yeah we Pictures today. Oh, when the family comes up. We should have like a backdrop. Okay. Here, you hold it. Wait, wait, wait. Let's get one of the family. Come on up. Come on. <laughs> they came. Oh, I know. I'm drunk. <laughs> 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 hey, how are you guys? Hello. Okay, I do have, a, I don't know if anybody's here for this or not, but I do have an announcement. Item, let me get the right item number. Item 9A is a consideration to reconsider a motion to approve a resolution awarding school support grants. If anybody is here for that, that item is going to be postponed to May 16th. I just don't want you to sit through everything only to find that out in a half hour or so. So if you're here for that, 
it will be postponed. And that brings us to a presentation by Yvonne Fry. Welcome, Yvonne. Would you like to approach? Yvonne Fry uh, is here as the CEO of Future Career Academy. Uh, Yvonne also works uh, at the city of Plant City, uh, where she works with some of our colleagues over there, some very good friends of ours. I first became acquainted with this program through their former mayor, my friend Rick Lott, who uh, showed me what they were doing. And um, during our recent council goal setting, several of the council members expressed an interest in things that I believed to overlap with some of the initiatives that you're doing. So we invited Yvonne and her group here to kind of walk us through a little bit about what they're doing so that we don't have to reinvent something that I think in some ways already exists. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Ross. Thank you to each of you for the time and the opportunity. And it was so poignant that what just came before, because it's all about community and supporting our schools and um, building strong communities together. And I love seeing that. I, I said to Ms. Wells, I really want to know you. So um, I'm excited about that opportunity. And um, I, yes, perfect. Um, so I want to I want to just set the stage tonight. Um, as Mayor Ross shared, I, I live in Plant City. That's where I'm from. Um, but at this point, we are serving the whole county. And um, I wanted to share a little bit about the organization first, and then we're going to do a quick overview video and then go into some of the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. Um, our nonprofit is called Workforce Development Partners, and our two signature programs are Future Career Academy, which, ser which serves currently high school seniors in all 32 high schools across the county, as well as Best Florida Jobs, which is our adult portion um, for workforce development. A program like this is important to seniors because it gives them an opportunity to express themselves and maybe expand on what they want to accomplish in the future. The biggest issue that we run into in education with the kids is them not knowing exactly what they want to do. Because nowadays a college degree can only take you so far without that career experience. It broadens their horizon, it exposes them to a lot of different people. Experience a whole bunch of job opportunities and allow myself to be able to see everything that I could do after high school. It, it gives us an idea of what's really out there. The Future Career Academy is a year-long curriculum-based program that prepares and connects graduating seniors with the great jobs and training opportunities in their community. Started over seven years ago in Plant City, the program has grown as a grassroots initiative at one high school to serving all seniors in Hillsborough County for the 2022-2023 school year. The unique thing about the Future Career Academy is it gives our seniors hope. Seniors can look at jobs in their community, jobs that are not just short-term, that can be long-term careers for them. The Hillsborough County Public Schools is so excited to support the Future Career Academy because it provides our students with so much hope and so many opportunities to have a wonderful career and a wonderful future for their lives. The Future Career Academy is grateful for the partnership with the school district, Hillsborough County and other government agencies, the business community, and many community-based partners. High school seniors begin their journey in the Future Career Academy through in-class curriculum, such as industry exploration videos, career choice discussions, professional development and workforce activities, and other assignments such as resume building and interview skills that tie right into their English 4 curriculum. In addition to their in-class curriculum, students are given the opportunities to attend four major events hosted by the Future Career Academy throughout the year. Our kickoff event gives students the opportunity to hear from leading employers through interactive business panels at each school to start the school year. Next, students attend field trips to area businesses. Students are given the chance to visit several companies throughout the day and learn firsthand about different employers in their community. In April each year, students attend the Future Fair Job Fair, which allows them to meet with leading companies, apply for jobs, and possibly be hired on the spot. Students have the opportunity to visit various companies in a variety of industries and learn about available positions and find the right fit for them. The students are also given the opportunity at this event to attend interactive business panels to help ensure that they're prepared for the next steps into the workforce. The culmination of the Future Career Academy experience is our annual signing day at each school. 
Students who have secured new jobs, apprenticeships, or training programs are celebrated at signing day by school personnel, their new employers, and their peers. The Future Career Academy is changing the paradigm of success and building a stronger community. No debt, a great job with a thriving company, and a career path ahead is truly the American dream. Thank you for indulging me with that, just to give a quick overview. Um, I want to share, as I said, we started out in Plant City because of our business community. It's been, um, we're now into eight, the eighth year, and um, the needs of our employers, which y'all are one of, is great. You think, I, I'm, I'm curious how many open positions there are with the city of Temple Terrace right now. More than we'd like. Yeah. There you go. And that's what we hear across all the industries. Um, our, our mission is to prepare and connect students to the great jobs and training opportunities to augment those, those jobs as well. Um, which spurs economic development and, and great thriving communities as, as well. So um, as I shared, you know, we start with we've got an overarching nonprofit and come down into these two programs and we serve a ton of different industries and government is a big piece of that. And with that, I want to share um, the invitation to be involved. Um, and we, we've got curriculum. We'd love to include y'all in that for next year localized into the schools here. Um, that's certainly a piece of this that we can do. Our business panels, um, we go into every school and do it an hour long presentation with Q&A at the end. The students come down and interface with those representatives from those organizations with great questions, great engagement, and our other government partners have been very successful with that piece and we'd love for y'all to be part of that also as an employer. Our field trips, this is where the fun really starts. This is the tipping point. Um, after the holiday break, um, we take students on field trips. This year, I gave you a report. That was our mid-year report that included our field trip numbers. And we went to 150 different businesses across the, the county for, for different site visits. And it, it was it's just an unbelievable day of how the light bulb comes off for these kids, comes on for the kids. Um, and what I'd really like to show you is your friends from Plant City, they've taken this to a whole nother level. And so the county, the city of Tampa, others are looking at how they're gonna do their own piece of this to host students from multiple schools in the area locally. Um, Hello, Plant Day. City, I'm Bill McDaniel, your city manager. Today, I'm coming to you from Plant City Stadium where we are hosting the Future Career Academy for all of our graduating seniors as we present to them opportunities right here in our beautiful city. This has been a great day to meet with our graduating seniors and talk to them about all the opportunities for employment and their future that our city has to offer, but most especially the opportunities for their future represented by a career with the city of Plant City. This has been an awesome day with great turnout. Not only our graduating seniors, our entire city commission was here today to participate in this event. Plant City staff has rocked it, helping support the event, and of course, all of the great staff and volunteers of the Future Career Academy working hard to make all of this possible for our seniors. We'll also be attending the Future Fair hiring events in April and invite all of our area businesses to join the city as an employer to show our new crop of graduates from Durant, Plant City, Simmons, and Strawberry Crest just what Plant City has to offer. So as you can see, there are some great things happening in Plant City. And when it comes to education, Plant City does it big. Thank you to the Future Career Academy for allowing us to host our high school seniors and giving us the chance to show them what makes Plant City a great place to live, work, and play as we take one more step into the future. So when you've got the city manager up in the bucket truck with the t-shirt cannon, you get the kids' attention. Um, How are you going to get in a bucket truck? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. There was this year over 100 different team members that came out and were part of this. You saw the parade going along with the equipment behind each department that was represented to talk about what do they do, why it matters, why they love working for the city, and with that invitation out to the students to come and join them. So very dynamic. And we just finished our Future Fair hiring events. We had six events 
Ms. Fernandez, you were able to come and join us for the East Tampa one. Um, over those six days, all across the county, we had over 1,800 seniors come and partake and enjoy the day, but these are active hiring events. They are learning a lot, they're, they're meeting people, but they are starting the application process because with urgency, we really want them to get started, go with the applications, go across the graduation stage, and then right into the workplace. And I wanna show you, I, I probably won't do the full one of these, but I'd just like to show you just what was last week in Plant City as well. We're so excited to be here at the Future Career Academy Future Fair. This is a great day here at the Trinkle Center. There is so much energy in the room. These kids are on fire with excitement and they're excited about the opportunity that's being presented to them. We're very excited to be here today. We actually see all the smiles of the kids' faces and their eagerness to learn about all the different industries and companies in our great community that give them opportunities to start their career. This is the seventh year that we've been able to participate in the Future Career Academy and it's so critical for communities like ours to have an event like this for the students to know what direction that they can go in once they graduate from high school because a lot of them have no idea. An event like this gives them an opportunity to figure out as to what direction they're going to go as soon as they graduate. The uh, whole flow of the businesses and giving the opportunities to kids to be able to interview and uh, them losing the whole fear of being in front of a potential uh, employer, I think it does wonders for the kids. I am so excited. The energy of the students walking in really got me motivated for today. Um, the students that I was able to speak with are excited, looking for opportunities, and ready to advance their careers. Today's been a great day. It's fun, enthusiastic. Everyone seems to be excited to be here. I see a lot of students who have extreme potential as well as the drive and enthusiasm. Um, they're very passionate, very supportive, they're energetic and they do want to work and learn and keep uh, keep growing. They're full of, of just hope for the future. I mean they, they see it and they're they're happy, they're I think they're gonna make someone a really good employee. Not many seniors know what they want to do. Like personally I'm confused still and I'm about to graduate in like four weeks so it's better to have opportunities like this to seek out what is there out there. It's really cool to be able to connect with those kids and to be able to show them what some of the possibilities are. These kids are the future, you know, they're, they're going to be the ones that are going to be leading us one day. So it's very important that we provide these opportunities for them so that way they can flourish. It's a great day for our students, it's a great day for our community, and it's so exciting to be a part of it. Lots of Lots of great times there. What we're underway right now is our signing days. And these are the very early returns of those students who have been hired. Right here in this community, Pepin was hiring students on the spot and are gonna be participating, for instance, in our signing days with our schools here um, in, this, in this part of the county. And um, so many great employers, so many great opportunities for our students, but we would love for y'all to be part of this. Um, and this is just the icing on the cake is the signing day part, but the whole process of how we prepare these kids, engage with them, get them excited about the opportunities with the city. The city of Plant City um, at our event last week had three tables. They had the police chief, the fire chief, the city manager, the two assistant city managers, and all of the commission was there, um, along with all the rest of the departments, to personally engage and, and really support those students and, and bring them in as applicants. Um, and they find great success with that. So again, we'd love for y'all to be part of this. Um, I wanna share our, our total numbers in through curriculum, um, over 12,000 kids are being served. So those videos that we're able to deploy and share out, um, but you see what's happening here with how we've, we've really reached a, a lot of those kids that are undecided. I shared with you the report, um, the survey report from the field trips. Um, on this one is really interesting. This is one of the questions we ask before and after on those future fair hiring event days of where are they planning to stay in their community and work? And you see the shift, this one goes kind of that way um, of yes on the left hand side, but it started out under 50% and pops up significantly of their desire and belief that there is opportunity there for them. Um, and the other part that I mentioned, best Florida jobs, we have an adult portion right after um, all of those employers, including the city, is set up, and um, we had over a thousand people registered, pre-registered for our six events, 
and we are able to share those with our employers also for follow-up, which helps round out your hiring needs and, and provides that whole community lift for adults as well that are seeking opportunity. So with that, if you're hiring, we can help. We would love to. We'd love for y'all to be part of this. And um, as we continue to grow, we, we are not expanding outside of the county yet, um, but a lot of counties and other places are asking for us, but we want to serve Hillsborough very fully, and that includes our, our municipal partners here um, and how we can just continue to elevate and provide opportunity and help you fill those um, spots that you've got. So thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Yes. Council member, question? I do have a question. Council Member Fernandez. Um, how can businesses or community members get involved with the organization? Call us. Yeah. We are always looking for folks that have great jobs. We're looking for career paths. So um, we're not looking for low-end, dead-end jobs. We are looking for opportunities with employers that are going to invest in their um, employees and help grow and nurture their careers. Um, I'd say about 90% of our employers have um, tuition reimbursement and other ways that they're cultivating and helping them grow a career um, and their earnings potential and, and so on. And those are things that we look for. But, um, I mean, we're, the door's open. We've got a lot of opportunity. And, and this year we served, last year we had served 10 schools. This year we were at 32, which is the whole county. And so two-thirds of the county was new schools that were like, what are we doing? How does this work? And now they are on fire. So we need more employers, and we appreciate any connection points that you've got to help make that happen. Yeah. Council Member Abel. So I think it was, you called it the future fair that you showed the images from. So that's a countywide event that seniors all go to, or are there various ones? So if you look on the mid-year report that I gave you, at the very top is a map. And we said, how do we get our arms around this? And we re really believe in the community-based model because we've got to partner with our local partners. We've got to partner with folks that are already in, embedded doing the work and so on. And so we have eight communities. Um, and so we do eight days of field trip days, for instance. But we consolidated and did six days of the Future Fair hiring events. We combined a couple. Um, to make it manageable because we were at a big venue at the, at the Tampa Convention Center for two days. So we have six days that are regionalized, localized with local employers and, and so on. So it would make sense. We Y'all could probably fudge over into Central, East, um, maybe some of East Hillsboro because you've got a, some of those schools, um, you know, so on to pull from. Transportation is an issue for students, the, the ones that we're serving. And so we want to make sure that they are local accessible jobs. So we base it that way, as well as being able to tie in that local community support with other organizations. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Very good. Mr. Braille. Ms. Fry, I'll be calling you. This is good stuff. Do I need to get you set up with the t-shirt gun? You're right. <laughs> I want to do it bigger and better than Bill McDaniel. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I will share, as, as you've seen, the enthusiasm that our city has, the county, there's a lot of folks that will share stories with you and, and tips. One of the things that we've got to remember, the students that are graduating this year, whenever they started their freshman year, COVID hit. And they, their, their high school experience has been unlike anything we've, we can ever imagine. And so how we recruit is different. A lot of them don't respond to email. A lot of them don't pick up a phone call, but text or get their Instagram handle, for instance, and start to message them there. So we also want to help you be set up for great success because it's not a traditional mindset of how we really engage with those first steps to help bring them along in a comfortable way for them so that we can set them up for success. So we would love to help, love the <coughs> partnership, and are, are really excited. We'll have our full calendar published the middle of May for all of next year, so we'll be able to lock in dates and plans and be underway um, very quickly with you. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming to our event. And you've been to some things as well. We invite all of y'all to be invi in involved. Um, so several on our field trip of our city commissioners in Plant City, they get on buses. We've had school board members on buses as chaperones. And just being able to experience this alongside of the kids, really to, to shepherd them to their greatest success. So thank well, you. Thank you for coming and, and spending time with us. Thank and. You. Thank you for making the drive. Appreciate it. Yes. So, all right, council members, has everybody had an opportunity to review our April 18th minutes? If so, is there a motion? Move to approve the minutes. Second. Motion is second. Any correction to the minutes? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are adopted. <coughs> Next, are persons wishing to be heard on items not listed on the agenda or items on the consent agenda? We have a three-minute time limit for all public comments. We do ask that speakers uh, approach the podium. Don't speak from your seat so we can get you on TV and get you on your name on record. And um, begin by with your name and city of residence. I currently have one request to speak. There are forms in the back of the room for anybody who wishes to speak. And we have Linda Unfried here. Good evening, Mrs. Unfried. Good evening. And Hi. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And it is very important because I've lived in Temple Terrace for 30 years. And I love Temple Terrace. I worked with you for many years. You did. Yes. And I am also, and some of you know and some of you don't know, I'm the mad lady, not MAD. I am the MADD mad lady, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. But that is not what this is about. This is about the traffic in Temple Terrace. This is about the speedway I live on, Druid Hills, which to be honest with you, when I take my three-year-old great-granddaughter out there, I shake because I'm so scared one of those cars is going to go out of control because it's really bad. So three weeks ago, I saw one of our, the finest, we have the best officers in Temple Terrace ever. Thank you. And he, was, he had stopped someone on Whiteway, and I said to my husband, we need to call him about Druid Hills again. This is getting ridiculous. We can't have them speeding like this. I called, talked to Michelle, and I said, I was shaking just like I am now. And I said, this is really crazy. They're going way over 25. They're going sometimes 50. I, had a, I used to work in law enforcement. I wasn't a deputy because I, I'm afraid of my own shadow, but I worked at the sheriff's office for 30 years. And one of the deputies was at my house that night, a corporal who does traffic, and he said, oh, my gosh, that man was, or woman was going at least 50 miles an hour. That was slow for some of the people that I see on that street. So I called, and right away she said, Linda, they're doing the best they can, but I will let them know. I will pass this on to the sergeant, to the chief, I promise you. She did, and the next day, and I said, you may use my driveway. I have no problem with that. Go in my driveway, and you'll see them. Once they turn off at Gillette, they're hauling, and they don't even stop at the stop sign at Gillette. So they were there the next day, and I think he left four times in maybe two hours, which is really ridiculous. And I know ever since COVID, since I work very closely with law enforcement agencies, that traffic now is crazy. It's very, very bad. I don't know what happened. I don't know why people are so aggressive, probably because they're angry still, but they shouldn't drive that fast in the neighborhoods that we live in with our children. So I want to say, I'm here to say thank you. I went on and on and on, but I'm here to say a thank you to the chief and to the officers that have been out there and, and neighbors of mine have said, wow, we really see a lot of their presence out here. And I said, yes, they have been out here, but now they're out here even more. And it's not just Druid Hills, it's River uh, Ridgedale is really bad. And so hopefully they'll be out there next time because two more grandchildren live right there on Ridgedale on Deer Park and they speed through there too. Thank you to all of you and for what you're doing in this wonderful city. And thank you so much to the police department. We have one of the best police departments in the United States. I love Temple Terrace. So thank you very much for letting me express my thank you. It should always be said thank you to the officers. Thank you, Mrs. Thank Andrew. you. So I think we should just adjourn the meeting after that, right? <laughs> so we do have one more request, uh, Mr. Juan Gomez. Good evening, Mr. Gomez. Good afternoon. This is Juan Gomez, my uh, husband, father, and resident of Hidden Oaks of Temple Terrace. As HOA board member as well too, we strive to foster peace and harmony, safety and compliance in our community for both homeowners and residents or, or uh, tenants as well too. Recently, we've had some events that have happened in our street that we would like the support of our officials. Uh, we've had parking issues. We've had uh, violations of, of, of different sorts and types, and this has occurred in the last week. I've uh, reached out to Tom uh, this week, and he helped us resolve some of the issues that had occurred. You know, some 
uh, unprofessional conduct that had, had occurred in our street. I think we came to a resolution. Thank you, Tom. Um, but we, we would like to see how we could be able to use the support of the city of Temple Terrace to just help. We have uh, issues with double parking. You know, we have um, uh, issues with notices being issued to residents that are parked in front of their house. We understand that the, city, that the street belongs to the city, city of Temple Terrace, but we do have uh, residents and tenants that do park in front of their house. Um, I, I don't feel that they should be not, uh, given a notice if they've been there for more than 24 hours. If, if there is another option or alternative that we could do, I would like to hear about it so that I could educate our, um, our neighbors about it. Um, and uh, this is something that I believe we have, I have spoken to maybe some of the deputies as well too, uh, sergeants as well too of some of the uh, in incidents that we've had there. Um, so again, if I like to hear how we could better create some, uh, some compliance and safety on our street here. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Would you pass that to the city clerk? Mr. Gomez, we have your email address. If, if you don't mind leaving your phone number with the city clerk so our staff can follow up with you, please. Are there other members of the public who wish to address the council? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Council members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? No nays. Consent agenda is adopted. <coughs> the next item and the one after, um, we're going to open the public hearing. I is that how we're going to do this? Okay. So, council members, the next two items both involve the annexation and um, the project going on for the property adjoining the old Golden Corral property. We had the first reading of the annexation um, at our last meeting. And so, in talking with staff and staff talking with the applicant, we have rescheduled some of this so that all of this kind of comes to us at one time instead of each meeting us doing the next step, which kind of streamlines it for the applicant, it streamlines it for our staff, and it streamlines it for us too. So what, Pam, do we need to do? Do I need to open the public hearing? And then, okay, very good. And so Mr. Sherman, our community development director, is going to explain further as we go. So I will open the public hearing. Um, this is the second public hearing and second reading of Ordinance 1546, adopting voluntary annexation of folio number 036-917-0000, addressed as 11714 North 58th Street. And our Community Development Director, Mike Sherman, will explain further. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. So tonight we have uh, scheduled two land use actions for the subject property at 11714 58th Street. And at the last meeting, as the mayor had said, uh, we just looked at the annexation. And I could tell during that meeting there was maybe a little bit of uncomfortableness that what happens if we annex the property and then it just dies right there without going through all three land use actions. So what I would like to request tonight from the council is to reschedule a couple of those, a couple of those hearings to um, later this month, or uh, excuse me, uh, well, here it is, let me show you. So tonight we're having a public hearing scheduled for a comprehensive plan future land use map amendment for the subject property, and I want to continue with that meeting tonight. Um, and I would like to, and we're gonna have a, we hadn't set a date for the rezoning of the property, but I would like to schedule that for, um, June 6th. Normally what I'd like to do is have everything run concurrently. I was not able to make that happen for this uh, particular land use actions. Then we'd like to schedule a second and final public hearing for the annexation for June 20th. 
the second and final public hearing for the comprehensive plan amendment, June 20th, and then the second and final public hearing for the rezoning uh, for the particular property from RMC to PD on June 20th as well. Um, I've emailed back and forth with the applicant or the applicant's representative, Mr. Todd Pressman. He's in the audience tonight. Uh, his indication to me is they do not have an issue with that. I think it will run a little bit smoother, and we're going to be trying to schedule these annexations, comp plan amendments, and rezonings running concurrently from now on. So I guess what I'm asking tonight is direction to do that. So on this particular item, this is the second public hearing just involving the voluntary annexation. So what we need on this item, what you're suggesting is a motion to post continue this to June 20th. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Is the, and the applicant's representative is here? Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Todd Pressman, 200 2nd Avenue South, number 451 St. Petersburg. We're happy to work with the city in any direction. Work with Mr. Sherman has been great, so we're happy to move forward and would love to get all these issues together uh, and run them as companions. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Preston. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Seeing none. Council member, questions for the applicant or for staff? Okay. Very good. Then anything else, Mr. Sherman? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So we do have one public hearing tonight, and that's for the to consider the comprehensive plan future land use that's map next. amendment. Yeah, that's next. Is that the next one we're going That's to jump the next into one, now? Yeah. Okay. So at this time, I'll close this public hearing and ask the clerk to read the title of the ordinance. And actually closing it. Yes. We're, just continuing. we're continuing it. Okay. Very good. So what we need now is a motion to continue this hearing until June twentieth. Move that we continue this hearing until June twentieth. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No nays. So now do I close the public hearing now or does it stay open until June 20th? It stays open. Okay. Tom, you have to stay here until June 20th. So. <laughs> okay. <I'm leaving>. okay. <laughs> Very good. Our next item related to this is the first public hearing and first reading of Ordinance 1547, amending the comprehensive plan future land use map of folio number 036917-0000. Addressed as 11714 North 58th Street. I will open the public hearing. And so the requested action here is to is to postpone this until June 20th. No, we're going to go with this one. We're going to go with this one tonight. The yes. second public hearing will be June 20th. Yes, if we then postpone uh, the three land use actions till June 20th, we can run them all concurrently for the second hearing. Okay, so this particular item is moving forward as, as agended. Yes, sir, that's Okay, correct. very good. Then you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Can you pull that? There we go. Okay. So, again, this is first reading of Ordinance 1547, approving the comprehensive plan future land use map amendment for the parcel addressed as 11714 58th Street. And we call that uh, CPA 23-01. The owner is Fala Ventures LLC. The uh, applicant's agent is Pressman and Associates. So uh, a little bit of property information here before we move forward. The property is located near Major Activity Center, which is the intersection of 56th Street and East Fowler Avenue. The folio number is... 036917.000. It's approximately 0.84 acres in size. The existing future land use map category is Res 20, and that's a Hillsborough County land use map category. And the applicant has petitioned the city to change that to the R18 future land use map category, and that is a Temple Terrace land use map category. The existing use for that right now is there's a single family home on that property. Uh, the proposed zoning is planned development. Uh, the proposed use of this property is um, parking, landscaping, stormwater management, and it will be included later on in a PD, which will incorporate both the uh, um, uh, 036908.000, which is the former Golden Corral. That's going to be redeveloped into two restaurants and some retail space. 
Um, and uh, again, the applicants uh, file out ventures LLC. So this is an aerial of the prop subject property. The property's bounded in, I guess that's like a pink color. Uh, it, its western boundary is the former Golden Corral, and it has uh, access right now to North 58th Street. So the request is to amend the future land use map uh, from the Res 20 to the R18 future land use map category. Uh, the subject property has a zoning district of RMC 20. That's residential multifamily conventional is what that means uh, in the county. Um, the max residential density under the um, Res 20, if it was to be developed for residential uses, is about 16 units per acre. And the property standing alone in the city would uh, yield about 15 units per acre. The allowable uses in the city once we annex that property and do the comp plan amendment would be for single family homes, duplexes, townhomes, multifamily complexes, neighborhood commercial, office and institutional and public uses. Oops, let me go back. So this is a second of three land use actions will be undertaken ultimately by the city. Um, and after these three land use actions, the applicant will come back with site and construction plans for development of the two parcels. These are some photos of the area. The first one to the left is looking south uh, towards Fowler Avenue. The, one in the, the second one is the west property, or the, looking west, it's a subject property. You'll see the sign that we put up for advertisement. The next one is Eastern property or looking across the street. And right now that's a single family home that's occupied and looking north, you see the uh, multifamily apartments adjacent to this property. This is the concept master plan for where we hope we'll get when we get to the PD stage. As you can see, the uh, larger property is where the Golden Corral is. The applicant's intent is to build two restaurants with some retail space. And the property subject to this one tonight uh, will be for parking, stormwater management. There'll be some landscaping and buffering of the resident of the residential uses to the uh, north. Let me go through that one. So this is a, a little table showing the existing uses, the future uses, and the zoning of the surrounding uses. I think I'm going back. Okay, so in the staff report, I've listed a number of goals, objectives, and policies that support this future land use map amendment. I didn't want to put all of them in there, but these are some of the highlighted ones I wanted to, to put in there. These particular ones will uh, basically are goals, objectives, and policies that um, protect the surrounding residential uses as well, will require buffers. Uh, no access from 58th Street to the property, so all the commercial development will be accessed from 56th Street. That'll keep traffic volumes from this uh, development on the residential streets uh, low because it will not be impacting the level of service on the residential streets themselves. Um, some previous actions that happened on January 9th, the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission held a public hearing to consider this request. The Planning Commission recommended to approval for the city. Uh, staff recommends approval also on first reading, uh, amending the ordinance to change this 8.84 acre parcel um, from the residential 20 to the Temple Terrace R18 category. What we're asking tonight is to direct the staff to schedule the second hearing of the reading of the ordinance again for June 20th. And when we do that, we can run all three uh, um, land use actions concurrently. I'll answer any questions that the council may have, or if any people from the audience want to ask them, I can Thank hopefully you. answer those as well. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, Mr. Pressman, anything to... Good evening once again. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, council members. Again, for the record, Todd Pressman, 200 Second Avenue South, number 451 St. Petersburg. Um, Thank you, Mr. Sherman. I think he's made a great report to you. I will just highlight two points. One is, by your approval 
of this uh, application, it is a reduction or decrease in the residential density from 20 units per acre to 18, and under the commercial intensity is reduction of 0.75 FAR to 0.35 FAR. Uh, and secondly, I point out that the um, existing future land use to the north is R20, to the east is R20, to the south is commercial, and to the west is commercial. So this you would be taking this category, this property, lower than all the abutting properties uh, where it's existing. And again, it would be a decrease uh, in intensity in regard to FAR and units. Happy to answer any questions. And again, we're happy to work with the city in whatever direction they want to move. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pressman. Are there members of the public who wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, council member questions. Council member Fernandez. So, uh, my question is really more to clarify the designation. So right now it is zoned uh, for residential 20 in the county. Yes, ma'am. So it, and we're, we would go with R18, but how does, how does it being R18 then allow for the use of being a park? I'm not opposed to this project. I'm just <coughs> trying to clarify for myself. How then does it, R18 allow this use? So uh, uses, intensity, and density are outlined in our future land use map categories. And the R18 category allows for multiple uses. It allows for residential uh, uses, single family uses, duplexes, townhouses, multifamily complexes, neighborhood commercial, office, institutional, and public uses. So because of that, we'll be able to attach this through the PUD to the property to the west. Now, to make sure that it occurs at the intensity um, that the, the PD has um, outlined, there'll be conditions upon the PD rezonings. And one of those will be, it will be combined into one folio number, and we'll have conditions of use that it must be part of the larger parcel for the redevelopment of that property. So the comprehensive plan allows multiple uses, and we will make sure that through the PD zoning um, designation, that will be developed as one development. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Other questions, council members? Mr. Pressman, were you yeah. wanting to, were you about to respond? So. Yeah, I, I just like to make you aware with these R designations, they're very misleading. So reading from the R20 Hillsborough County, which is where it is now, R20 allows residential, neighborhood commercial, offices, multi-purpose projects, mixed-use development. So it is very intensive now. And again, this direction reduces both commercial, which is not going to be anyway, and residential. So your action today reduces it. And I'll emphasize that, as Mr. Sherman has indicated, you're going to have a exactly specific plan, inch by inch, that you will have utter and complete control over. Thank you. Other questions, council members? OK, anything else? No, sir, I have nothing more to offer tonight. Very good. Thank you. In that case, I'll close the public hearing and ask the clerk to read the title of the ordinance. An ordinance of the City of Temple Terrace, Florida, amending <coughs> the imagined 2040 Temple Terrace Comprehensive Plan, future land use map for one parcel of land located north of East Farrell Avenue and west of North 58th Street, addressed as 11714 North 58th Street, legally described in Exhibit A, attached and made a part hereof, consistent of approximately 0.84 plus minus acres by changing the future land use designation on said property from residential 20 in Hillsborough County to residential 18 in Temple Terrace for CPA 23-01, providing for amendment to the official future land use map of the city, providing for severability, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict to with, and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion? I move to approve the first reading of ordinance 1547, uh, amending the comprehensive plan. Second. Motion to second. Discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? No nays. Motion passed. I do have one clarification, Mr. Sherman, because I have a conflict. I, the, the, you have to bear with us. There has been a lot of shuffling this afternoon on some of this. So, I have in my notes from this afternoon that we want to schedule the second public hearing on June 20th, but my notes here say June 6th. 
We will have the first reading for the PD rezoning on June 6th. And then we can have the second reading of annexation, second reading. Okay, okay. I just need to know, this is Ordinance 1547. Is the second reading going to be on June 6th or June 20th? That's all I needed. June to know. 20th for this particular ordinance. Okay, that's what I needed to know. So, so, so this ordinance will appear for a second reading in public hearing on Tuesday, June 20th, 2023. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pressman. Uh, we appreciate Mr. Sherman's hard work on this. Thank you. We appreciate your cooperation as well. Okay, next is a resolution amending the revenue refunding bond series 2017 chapter health system project to replace the existing LIBOR interest rate index with a SOFR based index. Finance Director Jim Ingram is here to try to explain this one. <laughs> good evening. Oh, uh, good evening, Mayor Ross, City Council. Actually, we brought in an expert to explain this one. <clears throat> but I will say that uh, this resolution relates back to an action that the City Council uh, took 20 years ago to authorize the issuance of uh, revenue bonds to construct hospice facilities. And these uh, conduit bonds, as they are called, do not constitute an indebtedness to the city of Temple Terrace. And like I said, we, we, we brought in an expert. He's an expert on conduit bonds, Mr. Kareem J. Spratling. He's an attorney with Bryant Miller Olive PA. Uh, Mr. Spratling focuses his legal practice primarily in the area of public finance. His experience includes nationwide representation of clients in all roles. And he is particularly skilled in the role of bond counsel on conduit bond transactions. So with that, I'm going to leave it to Mr. Spratling to give you explanations. Thank you, Jim. Welcome, Mr. Spratling. Good evening. Thank you, Ryan. With that uh, intro, I feel like I need walk-up music like the rain. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you so much for having me today. Um, again, my name is Kareem Spratling, and I'm a bond lawyer at a law firm called Bryant Miller Olive, and we have the honor of serving as your bond counsel. Um, unlike my boring friends who decide to specialize in criminal law or you know, personal injury, I'm an expert in public finance, which means debt incurred by governmental entities like cities or counties or public entities like nonprofits. So as Jim mentioned, the reason we're here today is because in 2017, the city ultimately issued a series of what we call conduit bonds for the benefit of an entity called Chapters Hospice. And what those bonds did, they refinanced some prior debt issued by the city, and then they added some new money and refinanced some other debt. The one thing that it's extremely important to notate about these conduit bonds is that they are not a debt, liability, or obligation of the governmental entity. So you might ask, well, why is the city involved in it at all? And the reason for that is when the governmental entity serves as the conduit and issues the bond, then interest on the bond is tax exempt for benefit of the holders. And so in this case, it's just think of it just like a bank loan, like a mortgage. Regions Bank owns the bond and the loan is with Regions Bank. But because these conduit bonds are issued, the interest rate on the bonds are approximately 2% lower than what they might have gotten in the taxable market. So when you're talking about $19 million worth of bonds for a nonprofit entity, 2% reduction in interest over the course of 30 years is serious money. So that's why you guys are involved in the transaction, but you were not the source of the loan that came from Regions Bank. And if chapters were to ever default on the debt, that would be their default. No one would be coming to the city saying you need to pay this debt. No one's going to try to collect from the city. It's chapters debt obligation. And again, it's placed with Regions. Um, the reason we're here tonight is because 
all variable rate debt up until about a couple years ago was based upon what we call LIBOR. And that's an index interest rate. So if you had a credit card, for example, it was variable rate, it was some percentage of LIBOR. Or if people had a variable rate mortgage, it was some percentage of LIBOR, which is the London Interbank Offered Rate. And even if you borrowed $19 million um, to finance some capital projects, it's based on LIBOR. Um, over recent years, there's some controversy about LIBOR and the banks possibly manipulating LIBOR to raise the interest rates. As a result of that, what ultimately came to be is that the entity that reports LIBOR said that on June 30 of 2023, we're not going to publish LIBOR anymore. Well, the issue is that this bond transaction, just like credit cards or mortgages, has LIBOR in the contract and you have to replace it with something. So in comes the Internal Revenue Service and the bond lawyers. What the Internal Revenue Service said that is if you change it to a covered modification, meaning an apples to apples change from LIBOR to a new index, then we won't trigger in reissuance for tax purposes of the bonds or cause any other um, tax consequences as a result of switching from LIBOR to SOFR. So the reason you're here today is essentially Regions Bank and Chapters Hospice have decided that they would like to switch the transaction from LIBOR. So where the contract says LIBOR, it would then say SOFR instead. And in connection with that, you would be receiving from Bryant Miller Olive, your bond counsel, a legal opinion saying that the change from LIBOR to SOFR and the amendments to the contract don't trigger an adverse tax issue as it relates to the bonds. So that's a short summary, and I, I also want to mention that Todd Webb, the C CFO of Chapters Hospice, is here in the audience if you guys, excuse me, have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Spratling. I think you actually did it, at least for me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, prior to questions, are there members of the public who wish to comment on this? Very good. Council members, do you have any questions? Well, would you like to say anything, sir? Okay. Do, are there any questions? Um, what is the SOFR rate ah, index? This, it's called the Secured Overnight Funding Rate. Um, and it's an interest rate that's basically produced by the New York Fed. So where typically, let's say, if I had a credit card, and I do, and it's based upon LIBOR, that's the London Interbank Offered Rate, it would be 79% of LIBOR this thing now would change to be 79% of SOFR plus some spread. So the change in the contract or in the bond agreement wouldn't change the actual calculation. It would just be based on a different rate index. A different index. That's exactly right, Councilwoman. That's it. Other questions, Council Members? Not anymore, no. <laughs> <laughs> and no one fell asleep. That was pretty impressive, I have to say. I appreciate it. Very good. Okay, if there are no other questions, we need somebody to make a motion, please. Okay. Um, move to approve a resolution amending the Revenue Refunding Bond Series 2017 Chapter Health System Project to replace the existing LIBOR interest rate index with a SOFR-based index. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion on the motion. If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? No nays. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spratling. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ingram, Ingram, and thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, Mr. Bayia, for trying to help me through this in the days leading up to this meeting. So appreciate all the support with that. Carry over council business. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we have one item on the agenda is a request to reconsider a motion to approve a resolution awarding grant funds to Pisa and Temple, Taylor, Temple Terrace Elementary. I would ask the council to consider uh, making a motion to postpone this item until May 16th, as it is on the agenda at the request of Council Member Schister, who's unable to be with us tonight. I move to postpone the item. Until? Until... Um May 16th. May 16th. I'll second. second. Oh. I think she beat you. It's fine. Motion is second. But Discussion. I have a question. Okay. And I, and I know that it's Council Member Schistler's uh, request. However, the school year actually ends, I think, two weeks after our next meeting. So if we, if we, in the last meeting, we agreed to fund the two requests up to $1,000 each. So does this mean that 
we're going to fund them up to a thousand dollars each or does this mean that there's no funding until this that, that's a good question and we did some count some research into that this afternoon and i'll let the city manager explain so we did reach out to to uh, actually we spoke with ms wells who had the experience on the committee and both of these items are not time sensitive so if you did postpone it to the may 16th um and then if you had to follow up and you wanted to change the resolution, that would be fine. There would be an issue with doing that. So we're, right, right now we're on hold uh, because there is no urgency. Okay. Yep, that's okay. a good, good question. We had the same question when we were contemplating doing this. So we have a motion and a second. Other discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? No nays. We will hear this item on May 16th. Is there any other carryover council business from previous meetings? Okay, very good. New business and board reports. I have two. Okay. Two items. Vice Mayor Chambers. Okay, and it was kind of timely that we had a person wishing to be heard on this item, but I wanted to commend our police department chief on the traffic unit. And we talked about it in goal setting, but I wanted to say it again uh, so the public could hear. Uh, I have seen them out there doing their uh, job with traffic. I, have, I don't do a lot of Facebook, but what I do, I've seen a lot of chatter about that. Uh, people are commenting. It is working. Your guys are doing a great job. And I just want to commend you that. I also want to let everybody know it's not a revenue source for the city. <laughs> I've heard those comments. Uh, it, it's not a way to fund our budget. It's a way to get our citizens to follow the traffic laws to keep everybody safe. So. Thank you. I pass that on. <clears throat> the second thing, um, the Rotary Club uh, did an event last month uh, called Riverfest down at River Hills Park. And I was approached by Nick Hall wanting to know how they could make that event a city co-sponsored event. Currently, they were doing it all themselves. We don't need to discuss that tonight, but I just wanted to give heads up to the staff that Nick Hall will be talking to you guys about making that a co-sponsored event so that was it okay other new business or board reports so I have a couple things I'll try to be brief um, first to start with the easiest one um, this week is municipal clerks week and so I tried to do a public reading of a proclamation but the city clerk threatened me with bodily harm, so I, I gave her a quiet proclamation, but I did want to let everybody know that uh, it's a good week to stop by and let them know that we appreciate all the hard work of their staff, the attention to detail, the, the clerk's office is one of those things, much, much like finance probably, it's one of those things that when it runs well, everybody just takes it for granted that it's running well. Um, it only becomes an, an issue for everybody when things don't go well. And so uh, thank you, Cheryl and Jen and Susie, for all you do. And uh, we, we don't take you for granted, so thank you. Next, we're supposed to be the police traffic unit, but the vice mayor kind of oh. covered that. Um, so as you know, we belong to the Suncoast League of Cities also. And we are the only Hillsborough County city that belongs to the Suncoast League of Cities. Plant City belongs to the Ridge League of Cities towards the central part of the state. So all the other cities in the Suncoast League are in Pinellas County. I'm currently the representative on the Suncoast League of Cities. Since I've been on council, we have never appointed an alternate um, to the city's representative. And I don't know if it's ever been an issue or not, but last week it became an issue because I had a conflict that I could not resolve. There was an important vote to change some bylaws and so forth uh, at the Suncoast League and we weren't there. And so I'd, I'd like the council to, um, some one of you to, to hopefully volunteer to be the alternate on the Suncoast League of Cities. Now, I must forewarn you that I don't miss often, but um, those meetings occur monthly. They're always in Pinellas County except one time a year. We host it once, and the other 11 meetings are in Pinellas County. 
and so uh, they're usually lunch meetings, so they're midday. And so um, I'd, I know who I'd like to nominate, but I'd, I'd, and I hate to put people on the spot, but I can't talk to you about this outside of a meeting, so I have to put you on the spot. But I'd like uh, to know if Council Member Fernandez, would you be available to assume this responsibility? Um, yeah, as an alternate. As an alternate, yeah. yeah. I don't miss much, but sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. I would like to nominate Council Member Fernandez, but are there other nominations that... I feel bad nominating Gil when he's not here, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but either if either of you would like to do it, I don't think you'd be breaking Allison's heart either. I don't know if you want to... Okay. So, is there a motion to appoint... Council Member Fernandez as my alternate on the Suncoast League of Cities. I move to appoint Council Member Fernandez as your alternate on the Suncoast, Suncoast League of Cities. That's almost a tongue twister. Second. Motion is second. Discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Opposed? No nays. Thank you very much for that. And the last item, I'll try to be quick and some of you know this already. I'm primarily putting this out for the public. The state budget in Tallahassee was finalized. It was printed today um, to be voted on before the session ends on Friday. So we're in it. Our appropriations request for our emergency operations center is funded in the budget at $4.5 million, so, which is a terrific thing. So the last hurdle to get across is um, the veto process. And so these types of projects, before we, before we schedule the party, these types of projects can be prone to veto. Um, and particularly this one, this is a rather large appropriation compared to other fire-related appropriations that made the budget. So we will be working on that as best we can to try to encourage the governor's office not to veto this. Um, but we are in, fingers are crossed. Um, this is a very good thing. So um, that's where we are with that. So I do want to publicly thank, no matter what happens, I do want to publicly acknowledge Representative Lawrence McClure for carrying this in the House of Representatives. And as most of you know, Mr. McClure previously covered Temple Terrace, but after the redistricting, his district moved, and he doesn't even cover Temple Terrace anymore, but, but because of his previous commitment to the residents of Temple Terrace, he continued to champion this project in the House of Representatives. So we owe a big debt of gratitude to Lawrence McClure. And on the Senate side, we have Senator Burgess, who is one of our senators, and Senator Rousson, who's um, the other one that covers a portion of Temple Terrace. And, and those three really came through for us in this session. Now, they don't control the veto process, but these three. So I'll be drafting something to send to them regardless of which way it goes. So, And that's all I have. Is there any other new business or board reports? Okay, city manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members of council, just uh, not really a presentation per se, but in your agenda tonight, and the public has this as well, I uh, have the quarterly uh, update for the second quarter of the fiscal year, both for the council's priority goals as well as for the budget goals. Um, if you have any questions about those, I'd be happy to take them, and we have our department directors here as well. Uh, and then also, and probably uh, somewhat more importantly, the, we also have the budget to actual fiscal expenditures for that same quarter. Um, uh, things are progressing uh, positively. There are no red flags that we've seen so far with any of our issues. And we are starting our budget process internally right now. So we're starting to put together a list of where we are now and where we're going to go to prepare for the uh, upcoming budget preparation season. Again, happy to take any questions. Very good. Are there questions? Yes. Councilmember Fernandez. And really, it's just a more for getting it out there in the public. So because you've got your your budget compared to actual, there could be things that, even though we're right on budget now, that we 
have expectations of spending in the future or something. So my question really is about where we are in the spending and revenue collection process. Are we on track for our expectation for the time period that we are? Or has anything come up uh, where our, our spending or our revenue has is not necessarily on the time track that we expected. Mm -hmm. If I could ask the finance director, Mr. Ingram, to come up. Sure. Um. Of course, there are a lot of variables in in the budget and different funds. Um, I and I I tried to in the report the cover report to address some of those type of issues where um, particularly like on the debt service fund we have two of our big payments are due right at the end of the year fiscal year so but everything's on target because it's that's why you see the expenditures so low um, so there, there is nothing that jumps out at me that would indicate a problem. I think mean, we are keeping an eye on, a close eye, on sanitation and water and sewer. As you know, we raised the rates uh, <coughs> starting February 1st, so this only covers two months of those uh, rates going up. The revenues on both of those, I think, when, when you look at just the revenue for the service fees, they're right about 46% of the target for annual, which obviously, I mean, it should be at around 50%. But since we did not raise rates until uh, February, we are a little bit behind on that. Expenditures, if you look at those areas, also are a little below 50%. Water and sewer in particular because we have vacancies, positions that haven't been filled. I don't know if they're trying to fill them, but that's keeping the expenditure side down. So nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that we didn't expect already. You know, some, you're right, some revenue streams, like in the Parks and Rec, we get a lot of summer revenue and so th there are things that are based on, on timeliness. That's it. Okay. Other questions, council members? Good. That's all I have. That's all you have? Good. City attorney's report. I have nothing to report. Nothing to report. Anything else to come before the board, council members? Directors? Public? Thank the Snellings for being here tonight. Ladies, thank you for sticking with us. Nice to see you. Anything else? If not, we will stand adjourned.